This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Voltoro, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely, starting at just one milligram. Go to Voltoro.com to deposit some Bitcoin and start trading today. And by Shapeshift, with no account or signup required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell gems, Dash, Nubits, Monero, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to Shapeshift.io to instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're back again today with, a, with an old guest uh, that we've had before, Tim Swanson. Many of you will know Tim. He's been very vocal in the Bitcoin community, making people very angry on Reddit. And uh, and, <laughs> and in the last episode, we, we called him the Bitcoin uh, hype buster. And he's, he's been busy keeping that up. But he's also done a, a lot of really interesting work in particular. He's written uh, an opinion, a white paper on this whole idea of sort of blockchains without Bitcoin, which is very interesting. So thanks for coming on today, uh, Tim. Hey, thanks again for having me, guys. I appreciate it. So, yeah, you have a, you always keep up this enormous volume of writing, which is uh, very impressive. And you ha- you've written some, some really important, I think, sort of thought pieces on, on the kind of evolution of the space. Among other things, you've written this white paper on consensus as a service. Can you talk a little bit about what the sort of, you know, what the main idea of that is? Sure. So, uh, yeah, last year I was uh, continually struck by this, this notion that uh, we are identifying people um, on both sides of transactions through these different on-ramps and off-ramps, but uh, we aren't doing any doxing on validators. And I understand, you know, the whole purpose of Bitcoin was we couldn't trust anyone, we couldn't trust the validators, um, so we use proof of work. But if you're continually to doxing everybody but the validators, why why bother using, you know, Bitcoin itself? Why not just use some kind of database? Um, and it was towards the end of the year that um, I began seeing a number of different startups um, emerge, um, and then early this year, they uh, kind of did a different approach. They did a, basically a, a what's called now permissioned or, or gated uh, validation um, uh, within the network, um, and that's specific to specific use cases. This is not to say that uh, it's the only approach or that it even competes with Bitcoin. Like in my view, uh, let's let's let Bitcoin be Bitcoin and not try to turn it into a million different things that it's not particularly suited for based on its capital expenses that, that are involved with proof of work. Um, and so it led me to, to write this uh, report, um, I guess, uh, two months ago. And uh, the, the, yeah, this is the main thesis is, OK, guys, well, at the end of the day, um, how how are we going to uh, do validation? Like, is our is one approach better than the other, or they both have different different advantages and disadvantages? And in my my uh, I guess uh, general take uh, over overview or take takeaway is that uh, there is no one size fits all. Um, they both have trade offs, and that they'll probably both coexist. So they have different uh, customers that want to use both. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess this is the idea, though, because many people seem to think in the Bitcoin space that the very idea of having a blockchain or, or doing any of these things sort of but separated from Bitcoin, that that doesn't work and that makes no sense. Uh, why do you think that idea is so helped by so many people? Well, number one, they own a lot of Bitcoin, so they want it to be that way because they hope, hope that those coins appreciate. And that's totally fine. You know, if if you were around 100 years ago, 115 years ago, and you're like, oh, I, I think the uh, aeronautical vehicles are, are the way forward, and you start investing in them. Sure, you, you, you might have been right in your thesis that they became big, but you may have just invested in, in, in companies or a company that didn't pan out too well. So um, I, I think that there's a, a lot of... Uh, also, ideological reasons, you know, there's a number of people out there who think that uh, banks and Wall Street and all this other, you know, the, the traditional financial sphere just could be destroyed. I'm not going to say that there won't be margins that will be eroded or there won't be entire divisions removed, like back offices or, or something like that. I, I, I can't speak to that. I really don't know. Uh, but, um, you know, banks each have their own, you know, 
in my experience of talking with different banks the last three, four months is they've all had their own teams, internal teams working, sometimes multiple different groups of people working on how to integrate this technology. So just like you had PGP and SSL and Linux and, and open source software in general, th these ideas that were forked and, and, and merged uh, within enterprises 15, 20 years ago, I think it'll end up happening with, with this tech too. Uh, I mean, you don't, <laughs> you don't necessarily need a Bitcoin-like blockchain though to do all those things. And I think that that ruffles some people's feathers because you know they they bought into this this narrative that's prevalent on Reddit and it, it conferences that the only one and the, the way the truth and the light the the one and only uh, savior for or, for or, or ledger if you will is is the Bitcoin ledger and maybe maybe that is the case but I, I have some doubts and we could talk about some some of those uh, in this if you like. So, I mean. It seems to me, though, we're talking about a very different thing, and it's often important to sort of like conceptualize that, right? Because when you when you start talking about uh, a ledger where you have different entities that are known, and you know we've done some podcasts with well Hyperledger or Ares um, that are both sort of tackling uh, that space, then it, it it's it's a really different thing, right? From ha where a network where it's open and sort of People in China can mine on it, and anybody can turn their machine on and participate, right? And it's it's trying to solve a really different problem. Yes, for sure. I, the the <laughs> Bitcoin solves the problem for cypherpunks. How can you do? How can you uh, process transactions like in Section One? How can you process transactions without a third party, a trusted third party? And uh, if you already, if you're a if you're a financial institution. You, your your starting assumptions are, are, are different. You already have uh, identities of your customer base, your staff, your partners, and your payment processors. So you don't necessarily need proof of work, but you don't need a centralized database too. There's there's still advantages of a distri distributed ledger, such as resiliency, such as the ability to conduct transactions without having to worry about uh, necessarily counterparty risk uh, it, for a variety of reasons um, that are trying to be tackled by, like you said, like Hyperledger, Eris, and Clearmatics. Maybe at the end of the day, we end up with a weird fusion between distributed databases and distributed ledgers for some of these companies. I don't think that the company, these, these large institutions are going to, going to disappear. Um, I mean, they, they all have enormous amount of capital to, to use to either buy any of these companies that have traction or to, to create their own uh, own systems that create this utility and enhance you know whatever customer services or reduce costs and so forth. Yeah, I, so I think that regarding the sort of Bitcoin Reddit narrative that uh, or the Bitcoin maximalism as we might call it, uh, I think part of that is also you know ev all these companies that are doing these really innovative things with ledgers sort of all get dropped into like the Bitcoin space where they may have been inspired by Bitcoin to do the types of things they're doing now, but you know, their interests don't lie with, you know, like you said, the cypherpunks uh, are not in line with the cypherpunks. Um, so, and I mean, I think we've seen this before in other technologies as well. I mean, just look, look, look at Linux, you know, it's powering all Apple and Android phones uh, and, you know, Apple is very much a closed technology now. So I, I think that's sort of part of the problem also is that we, there's no line between what uh, Bitcoin is trying to achieve and uh, what is perceived to be like, for instance, what the Hyperledger is trying to do or Aries or these other um, uh, permission ledgers that we can get into a bit later. Yeah, I mean, actually, one of the, the funny things about this is that when you looked at this Coindesk State of Bitcoin report and they said like the VC fundings for Bitcoin startups, they include like Ripple in there and things like that, which is, is quite funny, right? Because I find that to be extremely misleading. Oh, it is. Yeah, totally. Well, speaking of VC funding, um, so yeah, as of today, we've had about $800 million uh, put into this ecosystem. I had a, a post about this about a week or so ago. And if you just do the cost of customer acquisition, so a typical bank in the U.S., it costs about $1,200 to onboard people. And um, if, if you just do the division um, of on-chain users, again, uh, the whole you know, thesis with Bitcoin is you get to be your own bank and you're your own bearer asset. But if you look at the addresses, the entities on on the Bitcoin network itself, the on-chain side, um, there's only about 370,000 uh, individuals or entities that actually control any, you know, any number, any large amount, anything larger than one Bitcoin, basically. You could go to the Bitcoin rich list, they have the distribution of, of, of 99, 98.9% of all Bitcoins are held by, uh, by these uh, entities. So, 
if you just do the math on that, it's, it's about $2,400 per individual, or actually, sorry, about $2,200 per, per person or uh, entity, which is about twice as much as, as banks do for, for customer acquisitions. It might, might not be a perfect analogy, but the, basically VCs are spending an enormous amount of money uh, on trying to get people to do something that <laughs> they don't want to do. or in, Individuals prefer using trusted third parties like Coinbase and Zappo. And I understand, you know, no, no, nobody wants to sit there and have to go through the hassle of securing their own private keys. But if you're using these trusted third parties, why don't you, there's not, not a whole lot of advantage of using them versus uh, a large bank. And this is not to say one is better than the other, but if you just look at the actual, you know, metrics of it, if, if, if these if Zappo and Coinbase end up having to get licenses and, and do all the same rigmarole as, as banks do, at the end of the day, you just end up with a less <laughs> a less secure bank. Uh, and again, maybe maybe things will change in the future, but uh, that's kind of the way it's, it's it's played out the last I guess six years or so. Yeah, I mean, of course, the, you still have the option, right, uh, with Bitcoin to not do that. Like, I, there's a lot of threads now about Coinbase wanting to, you know, uh, prevent you from sending certain coins or coins to certain addresses, or if you received it from certain addresses like gambling sites, they'll close down your account. And I understand, like, I was told, and maybe this is completely wrong, but, you know, they ha at SVB, uh, they have basically 10 controllers, 10 people monitoring the blockchain actively at any time, um, looking to see where transactions are, are, are going or where they've been received like from. Coinbase does, or... Uh, I believe they work on behalf of Coinbase. Again, yeah. just what I've heard from multiple really good sources, um, and that makes sense. You know, hey, you want to you want to track provenance to see if it came from illicit trade. And the reason I'm saying it makes sense is they they want to keep their banking license, their banking charter, and so forth. So like they they have it uh, an incentive not to have that revoked. Uh, so they they go and look at this stuff. So I'm not saying that, that Coinbase is going to become a closed ecosystem. But yeah, for now, you're right. You can withdraw uh, coins and send them to different addresses and so forth. But if you're already doxing people on both sides, if you send coins from, from Coinbase to Zappo, why do you need Bitcoin? Why can't you use you know, uh, one of these other uh, ledger systems? There, there's no reason to go through a, a miner in China to do that. No, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you, right? There is this tendency. I mean, I think the bit license stuff is, is totally in that direction where, uh, I mean, I'm not exactly sure if that's still in there. But uh, for at least a while, it said in there, right, that a bit license companies that get a bit license will need to do uh, KYC on on both parties, right, on both sides of each transaction, right? So, and and actually in the digital gold book, um, it was also written basically what you said now that Coinbase has had for a long time they've had to, uh, you know, basically try to figure out where you send money and make sure that it's below a certain amount and things like that. And, and otherwise they would have to perhaps reverse your payments and things like that. And, and there are sometimes reports of that happening on Reddit. No, and, you see it all the time. I saw some of that this week, actually. Yeah, right. So, and, and of course, if you take this further, right, I mean, if, if there will be a point where maybe it says like, oh, you can't send from Coinbase to some unknown address. And, and if that happens on a wide scale, then yes, I mean, that, that really sort of breaks Bitcoin at some point. But I, I personally, I don't think that will happen. I think what probably will happen is just it drives people to using um, wallets that are run locally because there you just can't do that. Yeah, but those people are not, I mean, who are those people, right? Those are not the masses. Those are... Yeah, know, I mean, sort of, of course, it, it remains to be seen to what extent... Uh, this breaks through, and I mean, I think that's that's one of the one of the interesting things, and one of the ways I think about this. Right, is, is there's this really ambitious gamble and bet to have this global decentralized uh, cryptocurrency, peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency, and it's a long shot. It's a hard thing, but it's a revolutionary, huge idea, right? It's a huge idea that people keep their wealth, maybe in in developing world and other countries, in Bitcoin. And, uh, but a lot of startups, they are sort of implicitly making that bet. And then there are others, and I think that's where the permission ledger idea comes in, that say, well, there's something interesting about this technology, but we're not going to make this bet that it's going to like power this new world currency, but we'll use it for something else. And then that's sort of obvious and near, and it's not nearly as risky because you don't, you don't make that other bet. 
Sure. Obviously, I have, I have no crystal ball. Um, <laughs> a lot of the, again, I, and this is not to be saying that VCs are bad or entrepreneurs are bad in this space, but uh, almost all. I don't say almost all. A significant portion of the funding that's gone into it so far is based on um, forex plays. Basically, you know, uh, Bit BitPay. One of the guys was just talking this last week that hey, we we hold as many bitcoins as we can. We try not to sell them, uh, at least not on exchanges, uh, because we're we're hoping that it'll appreciate and therefore our investors make money off of the appreciation. Well, that's just an asset manager. That's just a forex play. That's not that's not pay, that's not payments. I mean, if if you go to AngelList right now, there's just Wait, under. Is it BitPay? Is that they are basically trying to speculate on the Bitcoin price? That... Yes, yes. I mean, I've heard it like four other, five other. I've heard it since the last fall, but this is the first time anyone said it in public. Um, it, you know, hey, we're holding on to as many coins as we can. As a result, you end up having you know a large amount of. <laughs> of uh, underwater coins on, on, on their books. And again, maybe it turns out well and, you know, they make a lot of money because it goes to, you know, 10000 or something like that. But that's a Forex bet. That's not a, a payments bet. Um, and so as a result, you end up like uh, Robert Sams pointed this out last year. Uh, basically, the whole ecosystem, not the whole ecosystem, a significant portion of the ecosystem is relying on price appreciation. So they're holding on to these coins and having to rely on VC funding on, on fiat cash and other national currencies to actually build the ecosystem itself. Uh, there was one criticism of, of an article I wrote, uh, I guess a week or so ago, about how you know miners over the last two years have received about one one billion, about one point one billion dollars worth of rewards. You have a wealth transfer from party to, one party to another in, in, in the form of the seniorage of this block reward, and um, you know they they didn't they're not spending that. You don't the only company I, I, I believe that's actually spending that is is Bitfury on on other investments, improvements to the ecosystem. Everyone else is just you know effectively cashing out, which is great for them. But the the point is is all these other startups are still having to rely on VC funding to actually build it. So Robert Sam's analogy was like it's just, it's like relying on People's Bank of China to to actually build your economy rather than using your own domestic currency to actually build it up. So again, you know people in practice. Uh, versus people in theory, people in practice are want to use this informational commodity to, to to speculate on as a as an asset rather than as an actual virtual cash or, or virtual currency. So I mean, perhaps uh, perhaps then uh, startups should rather be mining and using that mining reward to fund their their companies rather than getting VC money because. I mean, Looks like 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 miners are making more money than the startups are. Yeah, it's a zero. Okay, so the question is, is you know, what's your thesis? Like, uh, <laughs> is, is, are you are you willing to bet? Like, so mining is is a forex play. You are literally converting one national unit of account for a virtual unit of account uh, with the hope it's it's going long on one currency and short on the other. And so you know. Uh, <laughs> are you willing to, to play with variance? Is that is that the dance you're willing to do? Or are you willing to bet on um, the, the there'll be uptake through some other consumer facing product? Um, and again, I'm not saying one is better than the other. We know mining is zero sum. The only people who actually really make money are those who either steal electricity or have some subsidized electricity somewhere in China or, or, or Georgia or something like that. So uh, yeah, there's there's trade offs, and I'm not going to say one's better than the other. Uh, <laughs> I, I certainly can't uh, do that kind of judgment. It's time for a word from our sponsor, Voltoro.com. So, you know, there's different ways that you can use Bitcoin. Some people use it as an investment and speculate on it. But if you're a Bitcoin business like us and you don't have a bank account, uh, you don't want to be exposed to that volatility risk. And, you know, there's different ways that you could protect yourself against that. Some people have bank accounts. We don't. We only uh, use Bitcoin with, uh, you know, our advertisers and suppliers. And we don't want to end up like a Bitcoin foundation and lose all of our money when the price goes down. So we have to hedge, and to do that, we use Voltoro. So we at Epicenter Bitcoin, we hedge about 50% of our funds with Voltoro in gold. And it's super easy, you know, you deposit, it's there instantly. You can start trading from just one milligram, so, you know, there's no real barrier to entry. And the great thing is, right, you can really run a business, you can be protected from the volatility, and you can do it without having fiat currency and without even requiring a bank account. And then you don't even need to provide KYC if you deposit up to $5,000 worth of Bitcoins per day. So Voltoro makes it super easy, it makes it super convenient, and, and really gives you that option to be protected from the volatility and be a cryptocurrency business. Go to Voltoro.com and start trading today. We would like to thank Voltoro for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Let's talk a little bit more about this permissioned ledgers case. 
So, I mean, one of the arguments is, and I, it's, it's an argument that kind of makes some sense, is that if you have uh, a bunch of people who are known, right, a bunch of banks that operate this, this ledger network, why do you need it in the first place? Like, why is a blockchain necessary? Then what value does it provide if it's not that censorship resistant thing that Bitcoin does? Yeah, it's a really good question. I get this asked uh, many times. I think uh, Robert Sams actually has done the most uh, intellectual heavy lifting on this. Uh, again, if, if people are interested, I'd really recommend just looking through the report, uh, especially the last section before the list of companies that I, I look at. I think uh, the ends, it's between like page 25 and, and 28 or so. Um, and or actually the 20s, if you will, the 20s. Uh, in, in his thesis, and, and I guess a couple other people at this point is, the, hey, you could use this uh, data layer as both settlement and to structure what, what, whatever kind of instructions to kind of uh, this, this Turing completeness uh, that several of these systems have. Not all, not all of them are Turing complete, obviously, uh, but Eris, Clearmatics, and I guess a couple other ones could, could modify to, to, to use some kind of Turing complete virtual machine. The, the idea is, is you get to basically uh, use the the ledger itself as the settlement mechanism, um, which speeds up you know, settlement finality uh, between uh, numerous different, uh, well, in this case, financial instruments. Like the, this report, again, was, was basically just focused on uh, how could financial institutions use this for effectively settlement and clearing. Um, and so, yeah, you could reduce uh, you know, settlement time from, from T plus 3 to T to 10 minutes or you know, 10 seconds or whatever arbitrary amount of time you want to do. Um, and that supposedly will save people costs. So whether that does in the long run, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Um, so we'll, we'll, at some point in the next 6 to 12 months, I, I think we'll have more data to, to see if it actually you know, is a good idea or not. So is the idea here that, the, because of course you could have some central party that just does the, the settlement and then they could do... Um, just as good of a job as using a blockchain, right? So is the, is the advantage here that you don't, people don't want to trust some central party to do the settlement, and that's why uh, using a ledger is better for that? Well, we already have we have we have uh, clearing houses uh, and CCHs, CCPs that were created, you know, after two thousand eight to do just that. Like there was no clearing house for OTC derivatives. Um, and I know, at least with Clearmatics, and by the way, disclosure, I'm, I'm an advisor to both uh, Hyperledger and Clearmatics, and uh, just want to let people know that. Uh, the idea was, I believe that Clearmatics is saying, hey, we, this network that we're creating is actually the clearinghouse, or sorry, it, it is the counterparty um, that is distributed. So you have a distributed counterparty, effectively, uh, which makes being able, it creates a new financial control. Not only do you have segregated uh not only do you have segregated facilities for you know a variety of different uh, exchange or broker dealer and so forth, but now that you have this other financial control in which nobody can actually, or, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to to reverse those transactions or manipulate those transactions. That could be actually uh, reduce costs and, and create more transparency within an organization. Uh, with, with with Bitcoin itself, there is no way to, from a technical standpoint to actually prevent a 51% attack. Or, or history reversing the track. It, it, it's, a, it's an economic uh, incentive and economic issue. Uh, there's no, you know, <laughs> I think uh, it was it Andreas Antonopoulos. He got he got scolded on, on Reddit for saying, "Hey, we we could uh, rewrite the code, or we could, you know, blacklist different uh, different nodes." That's, if, if you could blacklist, then you, you you've kind of defeated the whole purpose of, of, of Bitcoin itself, right? The whole purpose was that uh, it's dynamic uh, membership who are who are, are signing these these Coinbase transactions, and if you're blacklisting them, then you're, you're just going back to this old system. So uh, at least for for censorship, um, with with these permission ledgers, you know they're, they're assuming that uh, you know irreversibility is the, the priority, um, and you could actually contractually uh, make that happen with 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 gated, with permission ledgers. Uh, you sacrifice some uh, censorship resistance for that, but uh, at the end of the day, financial institutions are more interested in irreversibility than censorship resistance. So why is that 51% attack threat such an issue? Uh, I mean, like, let's say you want to do a security settlement on the blockchain, because I mean, after all, so far, there hasn't been a proper 51% attack. Bitcoin's been around for a long time. Is is just that vague possibility that it could happen such a big problem for this use case? 
it's two things. Number one, ignoring 51% for a moment, you, any given day, you already have two or three pools who simply just have no incentive to add more transactions. So you only have a Coinbase transaction, one transaction in a block. So you have you know thousands of, of transactions that pile up, regardless of fees, um, that don't get included. So you, you have uh, a interesting game theory issue going on to where if you're trying to build a time-sensitive settlement product, uh, or something that ties in with the Bitcoin network as a settlement product. Um, you're having to rely on these these pseudonymous miners, who actually we actually pretty much know, uh, to to not uh, to include or not to include or to censor a, a transaction and so forth. Uh, but with the 51 percent, um, yeah, who who do you call if that happens? There's no terms of service. There's no contractual obligation to go through with this. So you're SOL basically, just like you know two years ago when you had that effective fork. You know, for you had 24 blocks that uh, were thrown away uh, that added up to be tens of thousands of dollars for some for some uh, customers for some payment processors um, in March 2013. Um, and so it, there's, there hasn't been an attack because there's no really incentive to attack. But if you start beginning to put um, large value transactions in bulk, um, you, you now have a, a new potential attack factor. I think that you know, you, you've had guests on uh, with Jonathan Levine, or maybe at least you've talked to him off, off, off chain, if you will, about this. You know, what 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 are the ramifications of putting uh, watermarked uh, coins on, or you know, color coins or, or meta coins onto a Bitcoin-like blockchain um, that are transferring off-chain assets or they're trying to settle off-chain assets? Um, there's again, you know, if it's already off-chain and you're having to identify these different users and so forth, uh, why would you go through these uh, pseudonymous validators? Uh, there's there's no terms of service for uh, you know it's, it's a communal <laughs> it's a communal issue right like uh, well who, who who do you call if they reverse your transactions what ends up happening is you go on Reddit and you complain a lot that's what happened there was a there was an instance uh, just last month uh, a user or two two months ago a user uh, accidentally sent it was like eighty five uh, Bitcoin for a transaction fee and uh, because of a BitGo uh, error with BitGo and they sat there there was uh, for a whole day there's lots of yelling and screaming and finally uh, it was a uh, bitmain they they run amp pool it's a chinese pool and amp pool said oh we'll refund your cash okay uh, and so like in the future you know are, are you are we going <laughs> to is nasdaq ready to have to go on to reddit and sit there and complain all day to have you know a uh, hundred bitcoin transaction or a watermark coin that's worth you know uh, enormous of value like apple stock you know, you put seven hundred fifty billion dollars of Apple stock on, on on the network, and you'll have new incentives to potentially you know reverse it because miners aren't really effectively destroying enough capital to protect that. There, they no way for them to recognize that that color exists and so forth. Maybe there's some maybe there's some solutions to that. You know, I've seen some proposals for for getting mining pools color aware or watermarked aware, um, but that. Why, why go through this rigmarole? Why, why use this proof of work network if you already have the identities of all the different parties involved? Right, right. So one of the issues would be, like, let's say hypothetically somebody said we want to start trading stocks on the Bitcoin blockchains using colored coins. Um, and then now there is a 51% attack, something like that. And the ownership has changed, right? Like, let's say I uh, managed to steal some Apple stock this way. Um, then what happens, right? Does that mean, like, for example, am I going to be able to use the ownership of this cryptographic token to now receive the Apple dividends and stuff? Or does that mean because actually I stole it and somebody can prove I stole it, that even though I now own this cryptographic token, I don't actually own the underlying asset, right? So I, that seems to be a, a big issue. Sure. Yeah. So I, I wrote a couple of articles last year with the help of some some people like uh, like Jonathan uh, Robert Sams. The idea is this: is if you uh, in the in the instance that somebody ends up with a a good or in this case a, a dividend that's not theirs, um, the company is left with two choices, right? They're they're left with either paying that dividend, um, which then makes them liable to basically. S uh, being sued by either knowingly paying a criminal or somebody that doesn't belong to, or number two, um, if they don't pay and they you know reverse that trans or try to reverse it or they just cut off that that coin or whatever it might be, um, then it defeats the purpose of using a decentralized network, right? So um, I, I think the funny the funny quote I've heard most recently is with uh, IBM and Samsung doing that partnership with uh, with the the washing machine. Um, Richard Brown was 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 on call. Richard Brown, if you guys aren't familiar, he's got a great blog. Um, he works over at uh, out in the UK at IBM, and this is just his own personal view. I believe was 
what happens what happens if we put these digital these virtual wallets on um, on, on these different machines these different appliances and they end up and, and we have these bearer instruments flying around and, and, and one day you wake up and your washing machine somehow has ended up with property titles and, and, and deeds to you know homes and hospitals and stuff like that like why <laughs> what do you do in this instance so you know it, it raises up a bunch of a, a bunch of really good questions but at the end of the day if you have real world identity attached to any of these things you don't necessarily need to use a proof of work blockchain for this so if you have to try to reverse those transactions or go to court and say, hey, court, you know, my property deeds sitting on a washing machine, you know, a thousand miles away, you know, <laughs> uh, what, what do I do? Or, you know, my, my house, my house, my, the, 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 my, my, the, my the washing pro- machine is bought my house. Like, how do I get it back? <laughs> yeah. Or, or, you know, you, you see this already happen with Bitcoin. You've had a, uh, between 2009 and 2014, you had about a million Bitcoins that were lost, stolen, seized, destroyed, basically ended up with without their the rightful owner, legitimate owner, however you want to define it. Um, and so this devolves into questions of, of bona fide ownership and, and Nima Dot. Like there was a really good law article written uh, earlier this year talking about encumbered coins or, or, or coins that, that lack good title. And since we've had, you know, like I said, a million coins that have been lost, stolen, seized, and, and, and re-lost, or, or, or sorry, re-stolen, and so forth, and, and they're mixed and pooled, it creates a, a, a problem for, for those who have clear title. Like, I, I, who knows if this ever gets big enough to actually sue people for, but there could be a, cha- uh, a, um, a, a case made that uh, even coins that you guys might have uh, were proceeds of an illicit transaction. Uh, there's, no, there's no way to, to effectively cleanse these tokens from encumbrance from previous um, illicit or accidental trades and so forth. Uh, so what you end up having is you have an economy that grants to a standstill because none of it's uh, exempted from Nemo Dot. Nemo Dot's what our, our, our currencies in the real world are, is that once they go through a custodian, they're magically cleansed. We don't have that yet in, in the Bitcoin world. Maybe there will be one at some point. But uh, yeah, this, this, this bearer instrument is is dual sided, right? You have the ability to be your own bank, but at the same time, if you lose that somehow, if you lose that credential, that private key, um, you lose access to not just the, the coins as they are, to, or the, the assets as they are today, but in the future, maybe homes, the cars, boats, and so forth. But, but I mean, how is that with cash? I mean, if I get uh, a receipt, you know, I pay something, someone gives me uh, a $10, or 10 euro, or whatever, that at one point were stolen, and maybe that number is recorded somewhere still that's that's now my money right nobody's going to come and, and take it away sure sure Wouldn't so this work a, in a similar way no well so right now there's a principle called nemo dot um it's actually longer it's a latin phrase and i've written about it three or four times uh i'm, I'm not the lawyer I, I talked to the lawyers that have been looking into this including ryan strauss and there's a guy at perkins foy uh perkins foy named i think it's george fogg who wrote an article that was quoted in the financial times a few months ago uh the general idea is hey Legal tender laws apply to uh, what we have, these, these national currencies. And I'm not defending legal tender laws uh, per se. I'm saying but the, the way it works is um, cash is specifically exempted from uh, having to deal with this provenance issue. Because just as you said, if, it, if, if your cash was uh, at any time proceeds of, or took part in illicit trade, the economy would grind to a standstill because you just you wouldn't know what to use this cash for. Oh, I just, I'm just going to leave it there, right? Um, but bitcoins or virtual currencies at this point still haven't gone through that kind of vetting process. There's no such thing as a custodian that cleanses or provides exemption to um, these encumbered coins, if you will, uh, or encumbered virtual assets. Maybe there will be at some point, but they're not. So, yeah, uh, I think that's something that uh, the legal community within Bit- uh, the the legal profession within the Bitcoin community is is debating. Um, you see it on Twitter occasionally. I, I'm sometimes interjected because <laughs> I think it's <laughs> I think it's a, a very interesting. Like Bitcoin's recreated all the, all the problems we've had the last 400 years with with the intermediaries, with custodians, uh, with currency itself, and we get to see it, you know, in a very compact six seven year form. Um, so it's 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 a very it's a very interesting way of just of relooking at history and seeing why intermediaries were created in the first place and why you know what what's the purpose of disintermediating if we keep on creating the same intermediaries today's magic word is hype h-y-p-e head over to let's talk bitcoin.com to sign in enter the magic word and claim your part of the listener reward So one of the interesting parts of your white paper, the thought part that I really liked is um, the way that uh, you sort of look at the entire spectrum of, uh, of you know, ledger technologies 
uh, from the fully decentralized to the fully centralized. And on one end, we have like Bitcoin type technology. On the other end, we have you know, the existing banking system. Um, and one of the things that you do in the white paper and you quote Meher Roy, who's got this really nice chart of sort of the, the different levels of uh, tokenization, I would say, um, that uh, we have sort of in this well, Bitcoin ecosystem, but sort of broader sense, like the financial technology in, in, uh, uh, ecosystem. Can you talk about sort of the different levels and the use cases that we would have in each level you know, going from like, for instance, like the Hyperledger type technology all the way down to Bitcoin? Where could we see this going in like maybe some long shot, like 10 years? Wow, long shot ten years. So that's a really good question. Uh, yeah. So for the for the listeners, uh, Mayor Roy, he uh, he published this really interesting t- two different charts. Uh, if you look on on the paper, it's on page thirteen and fourteen. Uh, basically, he takes you know different assumptions. What are what are your your investment thesis? What is your invention thesis, if you will, uh, from token agnosticism, which would be I guess Eris and Hyperledger, to cryptocurrency maximalism. Some kind of cryptocurrency work run uh, wins out for everything. The Bitcoin maximalism and hyper Bitcoinization. Um, hyper Bitcoinization is a theory that Bitcoin takes over everything and anything, and every you know the the financial industry is completely uh, in, in upheaval and destroyed and so forth so uh, you know the the, the the there's different levels of this and the VC thesis so far at least the public stuff has been uh, towards uh, you know Bitcoin maximalism or at least uh, cryptocurrency maximalism and even to some extent hyper bitcoinization so um, there hasn't been a whole lot of funding really in, in token agnosticism and I think that's not because VCs are bad or stupid or anything like that it's just it's more new like uh, the the narrative has been you know since 2009 that hey um, one ledger is going to rule them all and is going to absorb all the, the purchasing power of all these different fiat currencies and, and so on and so forth. Maybe that happens, but there's also a, a significant chance that that doesn't happen. If it doesn't happen, then what 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 can you invest in and what kind of startups are out there to do that? So, yeah, the, the report primarily looked at uh, levels two and three, token agnosticism and cryptocurrency maximalism, uh, at least companies that would, would fall underneath that. I, I don't think that the people within those companies – uh, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I, I don't think that the, they are necessarily uh, maximalist towards a particular uh, token or currency. I think that they're more looking for this, this, these business requirements that these different companies have. And maybe, again, and I, I think that tokens themselves are just a red herring. Like, maybe there is a use for it. Maybe there isn't. It just depends on the business requirements. So uh, for whatever reason, though, if you, when you go to these meetups, um, really, really smart people, all of them are much more brilliant than me, higher IQs and so forth, um, really good software designers. But uh, on the finance and econ side, you know, I, I think that they could learn a bit from finance and econ gurus in, in the actual the actual like uh, financial world. But they tend not to. In fact, <laughs> uh, not to pick on Coindesk, but they, they had an article like Villains of Bitcoin um, last year. And, you know, the some of the villains they had there were these econ gurus who, who, who tried to, you know, give free advice to the, the Bitcoin community saying, hey, you guys might be interested in knowing what's happened before in history. But, uh, you know, if... if I'll give you one one small note. I was in Singapore in, in November, and I uh, was um, at a couple different uh, events out there for a week. And uh, in one in one closed door session, there was a, a VC, uh, a lady who is who's out in, in California who works for a VC firm, and she's like, "Oh, uh, hash cash reinvented." Uh, rules of economics laws of economics we don't need to listen to these other guys and i was like oh wait so you're saying that the whole the whole world of economics has been overturned because of bitcoin and she said yes and stuff like that so uh, i'm not saying all vcs are just like her but i think that there is a bit of uh, wish, wishful thinking and um kind of uh that pervades this community maybe that will change and maybe my sample size is way too small Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Shapeshift. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade altcoins. And if you've been to their website lately, you've seen that they now support gems, swarm, storage coin, and master coin. So you want to trade some altcoins? You want to use exchange to do that? Do you still use a fax machine? Of course not. When you want to trade some altcoins, you go to shapeshift.io and get it done in less than one minute with no account or signup required. Okay, so here's how it works. You head over to shapeshift.io. You choose the currency you want to sell and the currency you want to buy. Let's say you want to sell some of your Dogecoins because they're no longer cool. And you want to get some gems, which it just started supporting. So then they give you an address, you send the Dogecoins there. 
and you give them your uh, your gems address and they put the shapeshift converts them for you and puts them directly into your wallet super easy super smooth and um, by the way if you have a website you need to check out their uh, shifty button so the shifty button basically you can put it on the website and it allows people uh, to donate or pay to you in any altcoins and you just receive bitcoin uh, it's super smooth and we use that on our website so you can give us all your coins of all kinds of currencies and we just get bitcoin and we don't have to worry about like having 27 different wallets on our phone and uh, laptops and have our, our whole bedrooms full of paper wallets because who'd want that so uh, head over to shapeshift.io and start trading small coins today and we would like to thank them for their support of epicenter bitcoin now, if we look at sort of the startup space, uh, are you seeing or should we expect as so, for instance, if Bitcoin doesn't work out or if we see the price stagnating over the next, I don't know, year, for instance, can we expect to see more startup moving into this sort of level two territory uh, into the, um, the token uh, agnostics type startups uh, where Bitcoin is not at the like sort of the center of attention? Um, I think you'll have it either way. Like. Again, once you start talking to financial institutions that have been destroyed, like that, that's a prediction. Like uh, 2014 is the year the banks are destroyed. 2015 is the year that since the banks haven't been destroyed, well, you can ask why, and then you start talking to banks, finding out, hey, what do you, what are your actual business needs? What are what are the <laughs> what are the reasons you haven't been killed by <laughs> killed by Bitcoin yet? Um, and you start seeing, you know, hey, maybe there's some some solutions I can provide to some problems, uh, but maybe not. Maybe none of this technology is actually applicable to them. I, I, we, we we certainly haven't seen any large production scale. Uh, companies have done that, even though, you know, obviously I'm, I'm hoping or betting on, if you will, with my advising time uh, that some of these companies do, do pan out. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, there's specific business needs that these companies have or organizations have that need to be fulfilled. Are you able to build uh, an actual product for that? And, it, it, you know, sometimes there's a token that might be used. Sometimes it won't be. Sometimes it may be Bitcoin. I, I have doubts it will necessarily just be Bitcoin. It, um, it's a whole other conversation, though. And so as far as startups moving into the space, uh, since I wrote that report and you know, I looked at eight different companies, I've probably come across another eight, nine, maybe ten uh, startups that have received some seed funding at some level um, that have at least some relatively competent developers um, and th that have come on my radar uh, that are trying to build products for that. So I, I suspect that that will continue going on uh, for as long as there's both capital and there's actual like uh, meetings with, with financial institutions, whether they're, they're willing to have that dialogue. So what's interesting there is the, you know, you, these companies have these business needs. Okay. Um, one say, criticism of, I say, the Bitcoin space in general is that it's trying to find a problem to solve that isn't necessarily there. Well, I, one area that I think really needs to be solved is the the micropayments area. Like, I, I really think that there there can can be and needs to be some really serious innovation there, and it can benefit a whole lot of interest industries, like whether it be pay, uh, payments uh, for content, for instance, or you know, like paying for Wi-Fi, little things like that. Um, what what are your opinions? Like, the biggest areas in which there can be innovation uh, using these types of technologies. Okay, so I can't speak for all of them because uh, I've heard a million different use cases the last year. I'm sure I'm sure everyone's at this point heard um, like a, a scatter shot of all these different use cases or potential use cases. The, the stuff that we were, the the groups I'm talking to primarily looking for back office solutions. Like they have enormous costs. Uh, Deutsche Bank did a study and found that you know as a as a sector the the banking sphere the financial industry spends about twice as much. It was like 7.3 percent uh, on IT costs relative uh, seven point Three uh, percent relative to uh, you know the overall costs compared to uh, other sectors that do like three point seven or something to that effect. Um, so they're spending enormous on IT costs. Why? Well, number one, you have to do a lot of reporting now and since post two thousand eight um, to to being compliant. Um, you need to be very transparent. So is there a way to reduce these cost centers? Like there, there are several banks that, that spend well over four or five billion dollars a year on operating expenses. That, and much of that's IT related. So you have all these acquisitions that took place you know, in the last seven years, the, uh, these systems that don't interoperate. Is there a way that you could reduce those costs with these different ledgers that provide you know, not only settlement finality, but transparency, provide the report, reporting require, uh, fulfill the reporting requirements, and so on. You don't right. I mean, I mean, maybe I should rephrase my question. What I meant to say is, uh, is so consumer-facing 
um, where so like for instance, micropayments can be used by consumers, uh, and you know there can be some great benefits there. Where are some of the areas of innovation? Because I, th I think that's where a lot of the Bitcoin startups are trying to focus or trying to find like these consumer facing innovations that can benefit people, but then they're just not finding them. Where do you think those, <laughs> those, uh... <laughs> yeah, it, it becomes, it becomes a, a, but with Bitcoins thing. Like there's a website called, but with Bitcoins.com. It's great. Like basically that's what's happened with these consumer facing products. I wish them really good luck, but micro payments isn't a new thing. Like that was tried 15, 16 years ago in the dot com bubble. There was uh, many different companies or not many. There was at least a good handful flus and beans were two of the ones that off the top of my head to try to do that. Um, so you, it, it, at the end of the day, um, it comes back to, you know, what are the frictions involved with that? Well, number one, obviously you have interchange fees, but it, it, let's, let's not do that for, look at that for just a, a moment. Um, but instead look at the frictions for, for the mental issues of, of people wanting to go in and out and having to calculate this. Nick Sabo wrote a paper on this. Uh, Clay Shirky wrote a paper. This was 15 years ago. They wrote different articles saying, what is the mental cost of calculation or the mental calculation cost of going through uh, in, in nickel and diming yourself effectively on these different costs? So I'm not saying that there isn't a case. You know, I see people talking about preventing spam. But for most people, spam is not a big issue. For most people, not wanting to buy an ad is an issue. Like, not wanting to buy content. We already have microtransactions in the form of ads. Like Google is basically a, a microtransaction engine. Uh, credit cards are micro loans, if you will. Um, although you have those interchange fees, and that I know people are like, oh, that's thirty-five cents. Well, at the end of the day, you're probably going to have to spend at least thirty-five cents for a Bitcoin transaction once once you have different uh, th things play out, such as the block reward having and, and and so forth. So I don't think Bitcoin on-chain microtransactions are a golden silver bullet, you know, uh, consumer-facing solution. Maybe it is, but I haven't seen any any good math on it that that, that, that this is sustainable. Uh, and there's already plenty of angel list, listed companies. Like if, if listeners are, are interested, there's a website called Angel List. You, you go there and you put your startup there. And you know the payment startups is over 1,600, and uh, mobile payments is like just around a thousand. So even enormous amount of competition that's coming in that has nothing at all to do with a blockchain. Maybe blockchain is a solution. Maybe it's not. But it, at the end of the day, it's going to be, you know, it'll be an execution race. It'll be a customer acquisition, you know, race. Um, you know, there's there's a number of different variables. And in, in one thing that's not being recognized is, is groups like Facebook and even Alibaba, they're getting money transmitter licenses to be able to provide, um, you know, basically person-to-person, peer-to-peer uh, transactions for almost no cost. Now, obviously, onboarding requires a bank account, so that doesn't help people that are unbanked and underbanked. But I don't think Bitcoin does either because, you know, people that are unbanked and unbanked, underbanked, they don't have access to cheap energy, so they're not competitive with mining, so they can't get coins that way. And number two, you know, many of these VC funded exchanges uh, globally in different emerging markets, you need to have some kind of vetting process that they require a vetting process through KYC AML policies. So in that process, you end up having to need a bank account in those countries. But those people don't have banks, <laughs> bank accounts to begin with to get on top of these platforms. So I don't think that Bitcoin is a solution for, for micropayments and maybe not even for some of this international payment stuff. But obviously, I could be wrong. Um, I know Align Commerce, BidX. Um, and coins.ph, they've all you know, claimed to have a bit of traction. Even Align Commerce, um, I was talking with uh, one of the team members, and based on their numbers, they actually sounded like they were doing more volume than Alipay, or, sorry, um, BitPay, although BitPay has been stagnant for over a year now. I think it's like 12, 1,500 Bitcoin. So maybe maybe it's not too hard to beat BitPay, BitPay right now. Uh, but still, uh, I think that uh, until more people publish numbers uh, in the actual math of like round trips and stuff like that, I, I think that um, we should be skeptical of gigantic claims without any evidence. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously with Bitcoin, there has been this this big bet that so far hasn't panned out. It may, it may in different areas, and I guess it's hard to predict. Uh, one of the things that sort of struck me about what you're talking about now, uh, I was recently at an event and, and something similar came up, and the guy was there making the point. It was like, oh, but if Bitcoin doesn't, you know, if, if Bitcoin doesn't work out, if that's not the focus on, I mean, there are all these other people doing these new things, but then it's like selling IT to uh, selling software to the IT staff of a bank. Right? It's not doesn't have the same revolutionary uh, excitement with it. But do you think? What do you think of the scope of this? Do you think these permission ledger stuff? In, in a sort of an optimal case would like truly fundamentally change things or is this just like 
I, I've heard sometimes the comparison like better database technology, which you know maybe is maybe one can build some significant businesses, but it's not exactly uh, you know doesn't exactly get people excited or make documentaries about it or God knows what. Yeah, sure. So uh, Michael Casey at Wall Street Journal, I had a call with him a couple months ago, and he's like, it's not utopian, though. Like, where's the utopianism, Tim? Um, and so, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, everyone has their reasons for why they're in this space. And uh, it seems to be, a, at least a, we, this is, there's no argument that a lot of it originally was uh, politically motivated. So if you're politically motivated and you're, you're certainly not like the John Matonises of the world or the Roger Veras of the world, they, they want to, you know, not have to deal with the third, these kind of trusted third parties that, that, that exist today. Um, but the question is, is is that actually going to play out? Like, are, are laws going to disappear? Are, are human institutions going to disappear because of a, a Bitcoin-like blockchain or Bitcoin itself? And I'm skeptical of that just because it, it that's not how people, people aren't cypherpunks, like, in general. Like, we could do lots of surveys to figure out what is the, the normal populace like that you're actually trying to sell this tech to. And they don't want to have to go through 47 different ways to secure their private wallet. They, they don't want to have to – their, their, their keys. They don't have to epoxy their laptops or spend, you know, 37 hours looking at YouTube videos on how to, you know, do these different steps to, to get away or to set up tour and stuff like that. It's, it's a lot of friction. Um, J.P. Koenig, he just wrote an article. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar, he, he's one who first wrote the FedCoin article uh, many months ago. And he just wrote an article a couple days ago on, like, why has uh, – why has the consumer adoption of for retail payments just not taken off? And he actually cited some of the stuff I did on, on BitPay, some of the, the numbers there. But the, the general idea is, is you have these frictions. Uh, which ones requires which one requires more hoops to go through? Using a uh, simple credit or debit card in, in a developed country, or going through all the hoops to get a Bitcoin and spend it? And based on you know his, his thought process and his experiment or thought thought experiment is uh, look, you just have to it's it's mental gymnastics to have to go through all this different all these different hoops to get to Bitcoin to sell it for another national, effectively sell it for another national currency. Why don't you just keep your dollars and, and spend those dollars uh, through these micro loans, through, through credit cards and so forth. Now, it's not to defend the, the incumbents or the status quo or anything. Like that would be great if, if, if there was, new, you know, margins reduced, costs are reduced, and, you know, consumers get some additional benefits. But if you're not providing those benefits up front and visibly to consumers, why are they going to adopt it? And so far, that value proposition from payment processors hasn't hasn't arisen. So maybe, maybe that'll change. But let's just look at the facts. Uh, just over a year ago, about 18 months ago, there was you know just just under you know around 20,000 merchants that accepted Bitcoin. Today, there's over 100,000. Um, and during that time, so you've had a quintupling of actual users or merchants accepting it, but you haven't had a quintupling of, of users actually you know going through and spending submitting these coins. And it goes to multiple reasons. Number one, the frictions and the hoops, and number two, the the fact is that most of the people who own Bitcoin own it for an investment for speculative purposes. And that's perfectly fine, but the, their time horizons are different to the fact that they think the, the future utility is greater than the current utility. And that's totally irrational, understandable. But as a result, all these companies that are betting on you know, transactional volume, such as these payment processors, it's, they're, they're, they're going to be left, um, <laughs> left high to dry, as they say. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, that wanting to disintermediate intermediaries, yeah, fine, have your own philosophy. But at the end of the day, what's actually going to actually happen, not just what you want to have happen. Yeah, I, I mean, it, that's true. I, to, to some extent, I feel that once you sort of take out the ideological, okay, libertarian ideas, which are not everybody's political leanings, especially, I mean, specifically not mine, uh, then you're left with, okay, then what's the point? Uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, I, I'm going to have to disagree here. And I think there is something to be said here. Well, that there's just one case that I think only Bitcoin can do and that is potentially massive. And that's simply the idea of having like a global currency that you can sort of hold anywhere in the world. You know, you can travel, pay with that. Uh, you, it's an alternative. It's a better gold, right? It's, it's a store of value that, uh, you know, you can rely on uh, and that's like finite and, you know, you can send anywhere. You can transport across borders without being confiscated uh, and, you know, you can transmit it sort of globally. And, and that's, I think, is a huge potential use case. And I think that's, it's really compelling. And I think also the thing is here, 
Bitcoin may all have all these flaws, but for this use case, the key thing is trust, right? The key thing is you need to believe that it will actually still be around in 10 years, it will be secure, it will have its value. And so if Bitcoin fails, like if some other guy comes with a better cryptocurrency, like Ether, maybe, maybe it, with proof of stake will be perfectly secure and scalable and cheap, etc. But it will be, I think, almost impossible to take that place of Bitcoin, that Bitcoin has today because people will be like, oh, but the first thing failed. Why would I believe in the second thing? That's not yeah. to say that Bitcoin will succeed. It may not, right? So, I mean, we've often talked about some of the security issues with Bitcoin, but it at least has that shot at something really big. And I don't think that's necessarily so political. It's partially political, but I think there's a real, a real strong utility there. I think that if, in, in my personal opinion, if, if I have the choice between Bitcoin in its current rendition and something more similar to a Fedcoin, and I mean, that's a terrible name. I, like I would never <laughs> use anything called Fedcoin. But the, what's common within the two and what I think is really valuable is just the ease of use. And like that's that's for me what I find is most valuable with Bitcoin is being able to use it cross borders, like pay people. Like that that's just like that just blows me away and blows people away when when you first uh, show them. So I think that if I had a choice between the two uh, and made some mental gymnastics to say, okay, well I'm gonna like trust this government currency, um, which I do. I mean, we all use government currencies every day. I probably would pick the government currency. Yeah, but I, I, I think what is also blow, what is something that sort of blows me away too is the idea of a global decentralized, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer store value and medium of exchange. Right? That's just, I think that's a mind-blowing thing. Uh, but but nobody uses it as a museum exchange. Like we do, I I think that between us three, we probably know everyone who actually spends bitcoins. Like period. Like, like what's the transactional volume uh, on a given day of gold? Like who are the wealthiest gold owners in the world? Like these are these are questions. Like at the end of the day, you know, if 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 it's supposed to be virtual cash, like that's what that's what the abstract and the section one are talking about. Like let's let's create you know an actual e-cash, digital cash, some kind of some kind of method for actual payments. It, payments is actually, uh, I forget how many times it was used. It was used multiple times throughout the paper. It was like 11 times, I believe. Uh, so like the, whoever created Bitcoin had this view that it could do all these different things, but in practice, it's not being used for those things because people have different time horizons, preferences, and so forth. So maybe you're right. Maybe it could be used for this all-in-one you know, global currency, but there's, there's no reason why it has to be Bitcoin itself. I mean, maybe yeah. it is. No, I mean, I agree with you, actually. Uh, for, as for payments, there are huge issues with it, right? The volatility is a huge issue for payments. Uh, and, and just that it's another currency, it's a huge issue for payments, right? Like if, if you, don't, you don't want as a company to have like more currencies on your accounts than you need to. Uh, but that's something different from, uh, I mean, e even one of the use cases that I think is huge is like tax evasion, for example, in the future and things like that, you know? Uh, and and uh, evading capital controls like these are uh, both huge use cases uh, and I think they're very compelling now whether one likes them or not whether it's whether people are attracted to that or not but I think it's those are just obvious and, and big use cases <laughs> the, you're, you're right they, they are use cases but the question is is how many people actually want to do that and how many people are going to fund you I, i'm sure i'll get you know a lot of slack and comments saying oh tim you're, you're defending the state so like let's look at let's just look at it from a practical i think standpoint. we're gonna get a lot of slack and comments for this whole show so anyway. like <laughs> so coinbase they you might they, as well go ahead <laughs> their their pitch deck leaked their september pitch deck leaked to the press uh free beacon did a couple articles on it basically like on slide two and they, they posted the slide uh it said you could use bitcoin to evade capital controls on on, uh, or sanctions on Russia, and then like a page later, they had different em emblems of the different like uh, New York Depar uh, Department of Financial Services, U.S. Finsen, all, all these different organizations. They say that they're in compliant talks with. So, but they got slapped. Coinbase got slapped because they're saying, "Hey, you know, you're talking about being a, a legitimate regulated entity, yet here you are saying here, one of the features is you could get around sanctions." Yeah, we, we know this. We know that this could be used for money laundering. Like I got I got chided uh, by a, an attorney this last week because I was. Quoting
quoted in an article very early this week. Mark Carpellis wrote this article saying, you know, talking about exchanges and mentioned how you know altcoins could be used for money laundering. And somebody asked me, uh, this, this reporter asked me for a comment, and I said, yes, you could use altcoins for for money laundering. Litecoin's probably the, the biggest use case for Litecoin right now is probably for money laundering. Um, and the, the lawyer got upset because I, I mentioned that without saying any statistics. Like, look, I used to do some stuff with an exchange, uh, you know, with, with Melodic, and you start talking to other exchanges and you find out, you know, what are the different altcoins being used for? And yeah, they're, they're being used. Basically, what ends up happening is people take their Bitcoin, they convert it to Litecoin, like on BTCE, they send it to like Shapeshift or uh, uh, Cripsy or something like that, and they reconvert it to Bitcoin and then they cash out somehow or they convert it to another coin. So it, it's, it's, you need to use, uh, if you're doing this, you have to use something that's highly liquid. And um, it, there's enough volume in any given day, especially on chain, that yours just shows up as noise. It can't be detected. Uh, again, I'm not encouraging that. In fact, I think that by by you promoting that as a use case, you just create a bigger target. And again, Bitcoin, the, the, the community is so small, that expect, accepting, uh, uh, thinking that they could absorb the gigantic fines that HSBC or Barclays or any of these other guys, they, they, they all pay like billion dollar fines for this kind of stuff. And sometimes even some people serve, serve kind of sentences and stuff like this. So encouraging that, I think is uh, i understand it is a use case and people do use it for that but i'm not sure that's something you should go out and sell to like normal people because maybe normal people just aren't interested in doing that no but i i didn't know that that was a, a specifically identifiable use case of litecoin yeah that's uh i mean i i always thought litecoin had absolutely uh, there are no use cases but i guess that's right there may be one um so let's talk a little bit about NASDAQ, because recently there was a, a news story and it got a lot of attention that NASDAQ is planning to have some sort of stock trading on the Bitcoin blockchain, specifically using the open asset protocol, which is um, colored coins, basically. We've had Flamia uh, of CoinPrism on the show, who is the guy who created the open assets protocol. Um, that seems to... That seems to go against your argument that it makes no sense to use the Bitcoin protocol for things like that. What's your point of view here? Sure, sure. That's a really good point. A uh, real good question, too. Um, so yeah, last month, uh, listeners are interested. NASDAQ announced that they're going to be throwing some of their private. They have a, several different markets. They're going to put some of their private market, uh, I guess, cap tables on, on the Bitcoin blockchain using it looks like coin prism, um, or at least open assets. I'm not sure if they're actually going to talk with the company, but, um, yeah, so there's two things here. Number one, it's unclear what that actually means. Are they actually going to do it? Just a hash of all the transactions and, and put it on the Bitcoin blockchain every day, uh, every, every minute, you know, what, what are they trying to actually accomplish with it? That's not fully clear yet. The, the second thing is if they actually try to put all the transactions that take place, the trading transactions, that obviously just from a logistics standpoint, that just, this won't happen because we know from block sizes that as of today, uh, you know, it just, the, the blocks are just not big enough to handle that kind of volume. Uh, maybe at some point there'll be solutions for that. Obviously, you know, Gavin, and we, we could talk about that at the, at the end, the Gavin's proposal and some counter proposals and stuff like that, if you'd like. But yeah, I, I think that fundamentally any time of watermark coin on a public ledger uh, using a private chain or quasi private chain, I think it's a different thing. But anyways, on a, on a public ledger like uh, Bitcoin, um, it creates this uh, top heavy protocol. Basically you're, you're cheating. You're, you're free riding off of everybody else paying, some kind of fee for what is nominally is you're creating extra value on the edges that's being protected by not enough value being destroyed. So miners in the long run, as we've talked about, destroy uh, destroy capital up to the point where you know a Bitcoin equals uh, creating a Bitcoin equals a Bitcoin in the long run. Obviously, there's margins and there's fluctuations and so forth, but in theory, that's what kind of actually in practice that actually kind of is what kind of happens when you have price run up so it goes up and when prices go down people go bankrupt and so forth but it, with, with color coins and these meta coins is they create this this top heavy non-proportional disproportional uh reward mechanisms to where pools or or, or, or miners in these farms are not destroying enough capital to protect you know whatever billions of dollars of assets that the actual assets represent from nasdaq uh, again, I don't know the specifics. I think it's 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 a little too. We have to be a little too speculative at this point. But I, I think that if they do do you know more power to them, they'll they'll, they'll do trial by fire and uh, maybe just like Patrick Byrne who announced they're going to do like a twenty five million dollar bond in the coming weeks and maybe even tomorrow. Um, that uh, they'll they'll find out 
maybe even the hard way the the transactions don't go through as, as I thought because there's no there's no priority system because there's no terms of service uh, built into the network maybe you could have you know one-on-one -on -one relationships with the pools but if you're using the pools to do that why don't you just create one of these permission ledger systems why, why use proof of work at all so you know I, I wish them all good luck and maybe they will completely disprove everything I've ever said um, that's a total possibility. Uh, I think that, that that Robert Sams is probably correct. Uh, like, you know, why why bother validating, you know, on, on either side of the transactions and not the validators um, who who cannot protect you against irreversibility um, if there's incentive to do so. So let's um, before we wrap up here. I know this has come up again and again and again on the show, and people are probably getting tired of hearing about it. But what's your opinion on the block size uh, increase debate? Sure. So I have no horse in, in, in the race. And again, you know, just full disclosure, I don't own any coins at this, at this time. And that's not because I hate them or anything. I just, I just don't. Um, so I, I don't think I, I'd like to think that I'm fairly objective when it comes to that. Obviously people disagree and think I'm very unobjective for not owning lots of Bitcoins or something. But uh, I, I think that, um, that both sides have, uh, have some pretty good points. Obviously um, Gavin and Mike, um, who you guys have you know, spoken to, they, they seem to really want to make Bitcoin become a, a large, they, they want it to be more successful with payments. They want you know, the ability for it to compete um, on, at some scale uh, relative to, I guess, PayPal or even Visa, even though those aren't necessarily the, the best direct comparisons. Uh, but the, the, there's there's a trade-off. There's a cost to making bigger blocks. And I was just talking to you know, Brian before the show about this. Is you know, if you, if you do a 20 meg block and you fill it up and you, you need to do that your own node at home, you end up with like a terabyte of data throughout the year. And if you do that, you know, if you need to connect with eight, 10, 12, whatever the amount of nodes your peers are that you're trying to, that just you know just adds up. You just multiply it, right? So uh, you know, there is a possibility that from a hardware and even a network standpoint that there could be a lot of nodes. But in practice, what ends up happening is well, we've seen, you know, from March 2014 to today, March 2014, there was about 13,000 nodes. Today, there's just under 6,000. Um, and that's not even, you know, full one block node. So, uh, so well, one meg block node. So maybe maybe that trend continues, maybe it changes. But at the end of the day, I think the other the other side of the argument, there's there's two, right? Orphan races and privacy. If blocks get bigger, um, fewer there could be fewer nodes because there's no incentive necessarily to run it. It's out, out of your own pocket. Um, if that's the case, then it becomes much easier to identify transactions, especially if you're trying to do money laundering. Like at the end of the day, you know these various companies that are doing contracting services for governments for for money laundering, they could end up re representing you know five, ten, fifteen percent of the network. It makes it much more identi easily identifiable. Um, so if you're concerned about privacy, then maybe that's something to to, to take into consideration. That bigger blocks make it difficult to uh, run nodes, therefore reducing the amount of nodes, making it much more easy to identify transaction potentially. Um, the other side also is, is, is what, the, what a lot of the Chinese exchanges and miners have been talking about the last week or so is saying, hey guys, um, we understand you want bigger blocks, but we just don't have the network to do that. Now, there's, there's two sides to that. You have um, F2Pool, one of the administrators from F2Pool wrote on the dev list saying, hey guys, we, you know, we, we'd like to have a bigger block, but not, you know, 20 meg or something like that because we just don't have the, the, the network capacity to propagate it uh, because it'll lead to orphan races. Um, I know if you maybe get on the show, Ifu Guo, he invented Avalon, the, the chips. Um, I just talked to him last week too about network uh, networking issues. He does a lot of network analysis now, especially for Chinese companies. And he was talking about, you know, if these, these you have these net splits in China because the, the peering agreements between China and the rest of the world are kind of kind of muddy right now because of how the Great Firewall of China is. And so what you could end up having is, you, you or what you do have, is you have a, a reliance on just a couple different nodes in a couple different cities, which could go out. So you end up with, you know, half of the network hash rate coming out of just a few nodes. And that's kind of dangerous um, even today. So uh, expecting them to propagate really big blocks is is another issue that he's actually trying to solve. So maybe if you're looking for somebody who really understands the, the Chinese side, understands network analysis and, and, and mining and so forth, uh, Yifu could probably be a, a, a good balanced approach to, to, to some answers there. Um, I, I think that there will be uh, some kind of consensus, if you will, but it could lead to a split. Maybe you have, as they say, Gavin blocks, and maybe you have different other, uh, a different chain, a Chinese chain. Um, I certainly cannot predict that, uh, but yeah, it'll be interesting in six to twelve months coming back and, and revisiting that question. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, interesting. Actually, we, I mean, we were aware to some extent. I mean, I think uh, Mike also mentioned that that especially, yeah, especially if you have a really bad 
really bad bandwidth, it can be an issue for miners to have larger blocks. But uh, I wasn't aware of some of the subtleties, especially that there's only so few nodes in China that play such a, a central role there. Um, but yeah, uh, well, thanks so much for coming on, Tim. We're sort of at the end of our show. We're going to have links to, to your papers and your prolific blog posts in the show notes so people who you know, who want to learn more about that can check it out. And I, I think the paper does a really good job at sort of um, giving an overview that's really accessible about the sort of different ways that blockchains can be used and some of the use cases that people often talk about, but that may actually not make so much sense for Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. And um, thanks for coming on today. Hey, my pleasure. Hey, and, um, we'll, we'll see if uh, if I've been able to kill Bitcoin as people in Reddit claim. So I, I don't think I, I don't think I have the power to do that. So I, I, I hope it continues to go on so we, we can learn a lot. So but you certainly keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> There's a node running somewhere. It must be taken down. So <laughs> thanks a lot, guys. Have, have a great week. Cheers. Yeah, and thanks for listeners for listening. Uh, we release episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. You can subscribe to it uh, as an audio podcast on iTunes or through your favorite podcast app or on SoundCloud. You can also get the video on YouTube at youtube.com slash epicenter And uh, we're going to be back next week. So until then. <laughs>